If you have your Bibles, please turn with me to 1 John chapter 3. We're looking at verses 11 to 18, 1 John chapter 3. I'd like to read the passage. For this is the message which you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. Not as Cain, who was of the evil one, and slew his brother. And for what reason did he slay him? Because his deeds were evil and his brothers were righteous. Jealousy, very powerful emotion. Do not be surprised, brethren, if the world hates you. We know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brethren. He who does not love abides in death. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. We know love by this, that he laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whoever has the world's goods and sees his brother in need and closes his heart against him, how does the love of God abide in him? Little children, let us not love with word or with tongue, but in deed and truth. Amen. Let's pray together. He awakens me morning by morning. He awakens my ear to listen like one being taught. The Lord God has opened my ear, and I was not disobedient, nor did I turn back. Amen. Jesus said in John chapter 13, a passage we're all familiar with, verses 34 and 35, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. Francis Schaeffer, in his book, The Mark of the Christian, says this about those words of Jesus. He says, this passage reveals the mark that Jesus gives to label a Christian, not just in one era or in one locality, but at all times and all places until Jesus returns. The way we love one another is really the trademark, according to him, in terms of what we're to look like compared to the world in terms of our relationships and how we love and care for one another. Well, in this portion of our study, in this passage, John is continuing his contrast between true Christians and those who claim Christianity, but whose lives don't support that, don't seem to match what they say. And he gives us the attitudes or the characteristics of both children of the devil, and the children of God. So let's look first then at the attitudes of those who are, as he says in verse 12, of the evil one, or children of the devil. And the first attitude of a child of the devil is murder. Murder. Look at verse 12. Not as Cain who was of the evil one and slew his brother. And for what reason did he slay him? Because his deeds were evil and his brothers were righteous. Murder is the ultimate act of hate and it demonstrates the absence of love in the most extreme way possible. And John illustrates the contrast between love and the way Cain acted in verse 12 when he says that Cain slew his brother. That's one of the attitudes of a child of the devil. Satan controlled Cain. John says he was of the evil one. 
Therefore, Cain slew Abel. And why did he do it? Well, because his deeds were evil and his brothers were righteous. Cain offered God a sacrifice, but it was not an acceptable sacrifice. And here we get into what's called the regulative principle of worship. Um, Worship, to some extent, is regulated in the Bible, how we worship. We're not free to just worship God any way we want to. Now, there's leeway. There's room for different styles and different traditions and so forth, but all under the guidelines of the regulative principle or of what God's Word says is to be included or involved in biblical worship. Abel brought an animal sacrifice, which the passage implies was in obedience to God's command. An animal sacrifice, the shedding of blood, it pictured the coming of Christ and his sacrifice. Remember, Hebrews tells us without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins, while Cain brought the fruit of his own labor, produce. He was a farmer, the fruit of of the ground and so forth for his offering. God accepted Abel's offering, but not Cain's. And it made Cain angry towards his brother. He was jealous, basically, of his brother's relationship with God. And jealousy is a very uh, strong influencer in our lives. Cain came to worship, but he was not a true worshiper. He was not worshiping God in spirit and in truth. And his disobedience... And the fact that he slew his brother revealed that he was of the evil one, verse 12 tells us. Now that same attitude of murder can and often characterizes children of the devil. And like Cain, those outside of the body of Christ or the family of God may often resent righteousness or righteous behavior because that kind of behavior can expose them. It may expose false beliefs. It may expose lifestyle, uh, sinful behavior, etc. We see that happening in our country. There's less and less tolerance towards any kind of religious dogma or any kind of true absolutes and so forth. Jesus said in John 3, 19, this is the judgment that the light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than the light for their deeds were evil. And so one of the attitudes of children of the devil is murder. Now, he mentions a second attitude and that is hate. Hate, look at verse 13. Do not be surprised, brethren, if the world hates you. Verse 15. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. In God's eyes, hatred is the moral equivalent of murder. Jesus said in Matthew 5, 21, You have heard that the ancients were told you shall not commit murder. And whoever commits murder shall be liable to the court. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother shall be guilty before the court. Whoever says, you fool, shall be guilty enough to go into the fiery hell. And so see, while only a small percentage of people out there actually commit the act of murder, many more people have hatred in their hearts. And these are challenging verses. Uh, John, in his typical fashion in this letter, is pretty black and white on a lot of the issues that he's addressing. And he says that if I don't love my brother, then I'm hating him. And if I hate him, then I'm a murderer, and no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. Verse 15. And so the way I treat my brother is indicative of my spiritual parentage, of who I belong to. 
Now, you know, you can be hearing this and myself, you know, and I may say, wait a minute, I don't hate my brother. But John seems to be defining hate <clears throat> a little differently here. He seems to be carrying it a step further. He says hate is really the absence of love. And if I'm not loving my brother specifically by laying down my life for him or giving and sharing of things I have when I see a need in his life, then I'm hating him. He just doesn't seem to leave much room here for us to be on the fence. John defines love not as an emotion, but as an act of self-sacrifice. Look at verse 16. He says, we know love by this. Okay, how? How do we know love? Well, he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. That's John's definition of love. Okay, then look down at verse 18. Little children, let us not love with word or with tongue, but in deed and truth. And so he defines love in two ways. We can lay down our lives for someone, and the other way we can love them is by sharing our resources with them when we see a need. Verse 17, whoever has the world's goods and sees his brother in need. All right, the only condition for me to be responsible to someone is what? I see the need, I'm aware of it, and I have the resources that they need. Whoever has the world's goods and sees his brother in need and closes his heart against him, how does the love of God abide in him? And that brings us to the third attitude that he lists of a child of the devil. There's murder, there's hate, and thirdly, there's indifference. Indifference, and this is what we see a lot of in the world today. Look at verse 16. We know love by this, <clears throat> that he laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Verse 17, whoever has the world's goods and sees his brother in need and closes his heart against him, how does the love of God abide in him? And so here John is describing someone who is basically indifferent indifferent to the needs of others, a lack of concern, apathy, not caring for those outside my circle of friends or family. You know, it's not always just the things we don't do that mark us or set us apart as Christians, but often it can be the things that we do do. We care for each other with a sacrificial love while the world is often indifferent. We share of our resources. We see ourselves as those who are in debt to our brothers, John says. Two things, again, make me responsible to my brother. If they have a need that I'm aware of, and secondly, if I have what they need. That's what makes me responsible. So, what attitude characterizes children of the devil? Well, hatred does. Its prototype is Cain. It originates in the devil, who was a murderer from the beginning, and it issues in murder, hatred, and indifference. Second, John gives us the attitude of the children of God. And that is basically the opposite, and that is loving one another. Look at verse 11. For this is the message which you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. And then verse 16. <clears throat> we know love by this, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. And so John says, here's how we know that we're loving one another. Or verse 16, we know love by this. And then he gives the definition of love. He laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. So here's what love looks like. 
John's definition of love is the giving by God of his son to us. God saw our need. We're sinners. We needed a savior. He sent his son to die for our sins. Christ saw our need. And he gave his life to become a substitute for sinners. He paid the price that we should pay. And when I personally come to Jesus Christ, I have to do it personally. I turn from my sin, I look to him, I receive him into my life, and then I turn the deed of my life over to him. That's important, repentance. That'll be reflected in the way I live from then on. When I do that, then I'm freely forgiven. I receive the gift of eternal life. I'm reconciled with God. I'm adopted into his family. God becomes my father for the first time. As many as receive him, to them he gives the right to become children of God. So here's the definition of love. Love is like that, laying down our lives. The essence of love then, the evidence of whether we have life is self-sacrifice. And John brings this out in the second part of verse 16. He says, we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. See, we ought, he says. We ought. Here's an obligation that John says we have. Why ought we? Because that's what Jesus did for us. Jesus washed the disciples' feet he said in John 13, you call me master and Lord and you are right for so I am. If I then, the Lord and the master, washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I gave you an example that you should also do as I did to you. And so who are our brethren? That's a good question to ask. When John says in verse 16, we ought to lay down our lives for our brethren, who does that include? Does that include just other Christians? Does it include just my family members? Does it include our family here, our church family? Well, think of the parable that Jesus told about the Good Samaritan, right? It would also include my neighbor or someone who has a need and I've become aware of that need, physical, spiritual. If I can meet that need, I should try to help. Paul said in Galatians 6.10, So then, while we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, and especially to those who are of the household of the faith. So we have a responsible to all people, but especially to one another, especially to those brothers and sisters in the faith. Here then is what is to characterize the children of God, a willingness to lay down my life and to show acts of giving and sharing of my resources of meeting needs when I become aware of them. And there's blessings that come. There's always blessings that come when we do things God's way when we try to do and we seek to do things in his strength the way he wants. And John lists some of those blessings. For example, and we'll get into this further in a couple of weeks when we pick this study back up. We're going to have a, a special sermon next week for Easter Sunday. But there's blessings. There's always blessings that come. Uh, the assurance that, the way of, that this way of living brings. Notice that's the first thing he mentions. One of the blessings is assurance. Look at verse 19. We will know by this that we are of the truth and will assure our heart before him in whatever our heart condemns us. For God is greater than our heart and knows all things. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God. So he says, we'll know by this, verse 19. By what? Well, when I take inventory and I see acts of love, I see sacrifice in my life to meet the needs of people around me, and I know that it's motivated by my relationship with Christ. That can give me assurance. Sometimes my heart wants to condemn me. 
right? Sometimes the evil one comes in my heart, or I, I'm not, I, I've disobeyed the Lord, and my heart wants to condemn me. It wants to say, Mike, you really a Christian? Mike, does God love you? But what does John say? <clears throat> By this, I can reflect. I can take inventory. I can see those times when I've laid down my life, when I've met the needs of those around me because of my love for Christ. And then I can remind myself that God is greater than my heart. Like he says, he knows all things. He knows me better than I know me. He knows you better than you, he, you know you. He knows those deep, dark secrets, but he doesn't condemn you. Now, he doesn't condone it, and he wants to change, and sometimes he'll have to discipline us to, to do that, <clears throat> but he doesn't condemn. Assurance is one of the blessings that we can know and experience when we're living like John is talking about here. Another one is answered prayer. Look at verse 22. And whatever we ask, we receive from him because we keep his commandments and do the things that are pleasing in his sight. I can have boldness in prayer. I can have confidence in prayer. Why? Well, what does he say? Because <clears throat> we do the things that are pleasing in his sight because we keep his commandments. There's blessing when we walk in obedience to the Lord. And a third blessing he mentions is his abiding presence with us. Verse 24. The one who keeps his commandments abides in him, and he in him. We know by this that he abides in us by the Spirit whom he has given us. So there's blessings. Well, <clears throat> John lays out for us the attitudes of the children of the devil and the children of God. And he says those who murder, habitually hate, or chronically self-centered and indifferent to the needs of others don't have eternal life abiding in them. But those who, as part of their repentance from sin, their trust in Christ, have renounced those kinds of attitudes, murderous, hateful Attitudes, selfish indifference to the needs of others, motivated by a relationship with Christ, they are the ones that give evidence that they've been born of God. <clears throat> a true Christian will manifest love towards others because, and that, that'll be seen in sacrificial giving because the love of God has been shed abroad in their hearts. And when that happens, when that truly happens, it's going to show up in the life. But we must be careful of self-deception here. It can be easy to deceive ourselves, to imagine that we love. The standard of love that John holds up for us in our passage is not only becoming aware of a need and seeking to help, but it's also laying down a willingness to lay down my life for another. That's what Jesus did, and that's the pattern that he gives us. Am I willing to do that? See, I can lower the standard, and I've done that. And I may be willing to give of some of my possessions, my money, and so forth like that, but even with those things, if I do it grudgingly, or if I'm not willing to lay down my life to meet a need, John says I'm not really loving others, rather I'm loving myself. I'm deceiving myself. I've lowered the standard. There was an article I read, and I close with this, that pictured an attractive woman, and the caption read, You self-indulgent, tight-fisted, modern living, comfort lover you. Do you really love unashamed luxury? Do you hate parting with your hard-earned money? Don't you really love the good things you work for? Don't you really hate being cold or inconvenienced? Why don't you fall in love with the things you really enjoy? Wow. In other words, quit kidding yourself and deceiving yourself and go on and indulge yourself. 
That's the message of that article. And that's convicting. It's convicting to me because I can be tempted to live that way. What would God say to me? You self-indulgent, tight-fisted, modern-living comfort lover? Or would he say, Mike, you meet the needs when you become aware of them. You give of your goods that you have when you see someone in need. You're willing to lay down your life for your brother or sister. What about it? How's your love life? Let's pray together. As our hearts are bowed, we all struggle with selfishness. We all struggle with self-centeredness. And only Jesus Christ can break that stronghold in someone's life. We can't do it. We can try. We can do it for maybe a season. But only he can break that stronghold, and he will. He will do that when you come to him in true repentance and faith. If you've never really, truly done that, you can do it right now. Pray like this, Lord Jesus, I'm tired of living selfishly. I'm tired of being my own God doing the things I want to do. I know that I have sinned against you and I've sinned against the people that I love. Would you forgive me? Thank you for dying on the cross for me. Come into my heart right now. Cleanse me. Give me the gift of eternal life. And from this moment on, give me the power to live the way that you want me to live. Amen. Amen. <clears throat>